Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining Gwinnett County Public Library for our Meet the Author series featuring Jim Grinsley. My name is Mary Mayer, and I am an adult services specialist with the library. Tonight, we will hear from author Jim Grimsley in conversation with our moderator about his new book, The Dove in the Belly. Now, I would like to introduce our guest for tonight. Our moderator is Patty Reaver. She is Gwinnett County Public Library's Youth Services Manager. She has worked with youth in public libraries for over 20 years and has a love of YA books. She's one of the co-hosts of GCPL's Spill Lit podcast, Spilling the Tea on Young Adult Literature, and she's thrilled to be here. Tonight's author is Jim Grimsley. Jim Grimsley was born in rural Eastern North Carolina and was educated at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, studying writing with Doris Betts and Max Steele. He has published short stories and essays in various quarterlies, including Double Take, New Orleans Review, Carolina Quarterly, and the New Virginia Review. Jim's first novel, Winter Birds, was published in the U.S. by Alanquin Books in the fall of 1994. Winter Birds won the Sue Kaufman Prize for Best First Novel from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award. He has published other novels, including Dream Boy, Kirith Karen, and My Drowning. He has also published a collection of plays and most recently a memoir, How I Shed My Skin. His body of work as a prose writer and playwright has been awarded the Academy Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2005. For 20 years, he has taught writing at Emory University in Atlanta. Please welcome Jim Grimsley. Very nice to be here. I'm so glad you could join us. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I want to just start off with, for people who maybe haven't read your book a little bit, if you could just explain a little bit about what The Dove in the Belly is about. Uh, the Dove in the Belly is a story of the revelation of feeling and, and love between two young men in the middle 1970s at the University of North Carolina, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It's a, it's a very frank love story um, about a young man named um, Ronnie who comes from rural North Carolina and a young man named Ben who comes from rural Virginia. Um, Ronnie meets Ben through a tutoring that he does for athletes in the dormitory where he lives and sets his sights on him and maneuvers his way into you know, getting him into a relationship, which finally happens just as just before the book starts. And the, the book begins in May as they're both about to leave campus after this very intense semester where they've come together. And Ronnie decides to move out of the dorm and that sets off a sort of emotional storm between the two of them. Um, so what is really, a, the story is really about an intense first love that has to be hidden because in the 70s, you know, gay people were not very open about, gay men were not very open about their, their love lives. Um, what I'm really trying to do in the book is to, record the history of what love was like in that era and offer especially to young teenagers teenage gay people um g l b t q people that you know that our way of loving each other has history and it's not the same history as as heterosexual people or cisgendered people and it, it it's all it's a it's a very complicated history that I want to preserve. So I had read that you um, 
said that you had wished you had a book like this when you were in your team. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk. Uh, how does that feel? What does that mean to you to have this book out in the world? It's wonderful. Uh, um, it, it makes me feel that like it, 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 it fulfills what I think is my purpose as a writer, which is to, to put these stories into the world. And especially to give young people with my kind of sexuality um, something to grab, something to hold on to through their teenage years. I published another novel somewhat like this one dream boy back in the back in the 90s and I got an enormous response to that back then a lot of especially young young gay men and women wrote me to to say how much it had meant to them to find this book and so this was another way of 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 adding to that 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 shelf in the library Excellent. We always need those books in our libraries. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, what did you find most challenging in the writing of this book? Um, the, I guess probably the most challenging thing was it was a feeling, the feeling between these two boys was so intense that I just wanted to live there. And so um, I overwrote it, you know, I indulged myself in it. I, you know, I, I enjoyed writing their conversations and I wrote vastly, vastly more than I needed. I, um, I, I was just so obsessed with them that I wanted to live inside the book myself for, for a long time. So it took me some, some, time and some really good editing to pull the book back into the place where it needed to be and to see what was missing there. Um, my editor, David Levine, um, Arthur Levine, I mean, um, it, he really wanted me to write the full relationships, even though I'd started kind of in the middle of it. He wanted me to go back to the beginning of it and to map the whole thing. So we worked out how that would be done within the framework of the book that I'd presented him. And, He's brilliant. He's a really wonderful man to work with. The whole pub the publisher has been really wonderful to work with. This is my first foray into young adult fiction, and that was a it, it was a, a marvel to see how the kind of care they put into the books. So yeah, I noticed that there's a lot of um, not time jumping, but it does start just right in the middle and then goes back and tells right this story. right. And I, I think it works really well. It's it's yeah. really an interesting way to tell that story. Um, and then, um, so I was wondering, so you said that you overwrote. <laughs> Does that yeah. mean, yeah. is there a scene or something that you had to cut that uh, you wish you could have kept in the book? <laughs> um that I wish I could have kept in the book no <laughs> what I did was you know I I had to trim the conversations the book is very it, the book relies on their talk on the way on the on their manner of speaking to, to each other but also there are there are a number of scenes that are very extended because what I really wanted to do was map their first night together they're, they're the sexual territory that they cross over when they finally get together um and it was so much fun to do that that i drew the conversation out and and, and i had to go back and think well this just you know this goes flat here it, it, so it, it's not that i left any scene out it's that i trimmed all of them to a point that they um they they had an arc to them they had attention to them. So, okay. Yeah. Do you have a favorite character? Oh, I love Ben. I mean, <laughs> Ben is just, <laughs> he's, you know, I had thought he was going to be the most difficult character to handle, but he's so comfortable in his own skin. You know, a lot of people, uh, people writing about the book have, have commented that he's a straight guy which he refuses to say, you know, in, in the book, he's, it's always, 
Ronnie who tells him he's probably going to end up with a woman and and Ben really never believes him you know never he, he Ben never claims any kind of identity for himself Ben is just Ben he he does what he wants to do with his body he does what feels good with his body and he finds something in Ronnie that he hasn't found anywhere else so yeah he's he's a he's a marvel to me I really enjoyed writing him reading the book I, he I didn't think I was going to like him at first yeah and it was through his conversations with Ronnie and the quieter moments in their relationship that yeah I really came to to like Ben which yeah. surprised me <laughs> well it, it surprised me too and I think it surprised Ben too I don't think he's ever had that many quieter moments with people um, and I think that's what really draws him to Ronnie is that Ronnie brings the side of him out and he finds it, he finds it to be really special, the, the side of himself that he, that he, that he allows to unfold. So, yeah, I wasn't sure if I was going to like him either. He, because he's, he's so full of bluster and, and force and aggressiveness and, and anger. I mean, he says this about himself, but the, the, that he's, he's got a temper, he's, he's, he's physical, he's, he's not careful about his language, he's sometimes a, even a little threatening, but as he, as he grows into this night and the nights that follow and the weeks that follow and the months that follow he finds some core of himself that's quieter and calmer and that's what he reaches for I felt like the sense of place in your book was almost its own character that yeah. that feeling of being on that college campus in that particular time period yeah, Can you yeah. talk a little bit about why you chose both that time period and, and that location and how that happened the, the the surface answer is really simple I chose that college campus because that's where I went and I chose that time period because that's when I was there um, and because I could write it with I could use my own memory and my sense memories of the campus and my knowledge of that period to evoke the music and the the way the campus looked and the feeling of you know spring and summer and fall in North Carolina and the feeling of being a student being young there at that time at that particular era when the 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 hippie movements of the 60s and early 70s were coming to an end and the 70s were asserting themselves in all their disco glory um it's it's that's but the process of putting that into the book was more complicated because when I was writing the book first like I said the conversations took me over and so for a while I thought this was going to be a sort of Roddy Doyle style dialogue driven novel you know where where the the narrative itself was kind of minimal but a, a couple of early readers told me that that the, the pictures that were usually in my writing in my other books were missing for them and so I had to go back through it over and over again and slow it down and restore that feeling of the world you know draw the world a little bit at a time which involved going back to the campus and walking around and remembering it and going back to my hotel room and revising stuff in the hotel room. I stayed at a Carolinian for a couple of weeks, uh, partly to work on this book and partly to work on other books, but I just reconstructed the memories as well as I could in myself and then in inserted them very carefully into the different by then the book had been framed out so I, I could look for specific parts to do each of the things that I wanted to do in the book and draw the pictures. It's very, it, it, it has that feeling of a summer 
mm. time read it yeah. just felt like summer to me <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> well that was in your when there wasn't much air conditioning so the heat really <laughs> did feel like, you felt that heat in those days <laughs> Oh, I do. I will say that that was it was one of those things where I was like, oh, oh gosh, you know, I forget because I read so much contemporary. I forget about having not having cell phones, just the, right. like him having to track down a telephone and, <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. the right. newspaper. And so it's like it was very much it was a lot of fun to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a world that I know better than I know the social media world of today. <laughs> <laughs> not it's not that I'm resistant to it. It's just that I it didn't I didn't come up with it. I've had to adapt myself to all of the technology that we use now. Whereas there was something so essential about your teenage years, you do feel like as if you placed yourself there in your mind. Particularly, I think it's what why a lot of people my age. I'm I'm trying to avoid this myself, but they they become that kind of old person who says, "Oh, things were much simpler and better when I was young." You know, I don't believe that at all, but uh, but I can see why that's a very tempting point of view. Yeah, I've reached the point where I'm like, I don't I don't want to learn anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I reached that point a, a good while back. <laughs> But you can't really live there because you're going to have to keep learning things until you, you know, vanish from the world. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons I love working with teens. They, yeah. they teach me all that stuff. <laughs> they, they really do. I, you know, I, teaching has, has kept me alive that way. I mean, this thing that we're doing right now didn't exist before the pandemic. This is another one of those adaptations we've all had to endure. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, so your book, it ties, it's, it's very much about love, but it ties a lot of, of grief and loss into your book yeah. as well. And yeah. it felt like both times that, that Ronnie and Ben come together, it, it, it is because of the loss of, of sort of a maternal, a mother and, and a maternal figure. Right, um, right. Can you talk a little bit about the your feelings on the relationship between love and grief and, and kind of why you chose um, to have that be such an important part of the book? Ben's loss of his mother is the thing, it's the event that makes him live in the moment more fully with Ronnie. It's the thing that startles him into realizing that this is something he doesn't want to lose. Um, and for Ronnie, who has a more troubled relationship with his own mother, it it wakes him up to the to the notion that, you know, things do come to an end. I think, especially for Ben, um, the loss later of the woman in the boarding house, is a smaller loss that he can get his head around and it enables him to go back and cope with the loss of his mother better. Um, I don't know if their relationship would have gone very far if they hadn't been confronted with that kind of an issue. I mean, I think they would have had an, maybe an intense physical relationship that then disappeared from both of them. But the fact that they together lived through these traumas, these losses, that forges some kind of link between them that they can't let go of. Um, so I think that's the best answer I can give you to that question, yeah. Um, so is there, do you think, you've talked a little bit about how much you like Ben, yeah. Do you think you would get along? Like if you if you met Ronnie and Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd get along with Ronnie better than Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I'm more like, I mean, I'd be scared of Ben. <laughs> that's oh, why well. I, that's why I was that's why I admired Ronnie because yeah, he was he was scared of football players I mean I, I haven't mentioned it but Ronnie does play football for the the college 
I mean, Ben plays football for the college. Um, Ronnie's scared of that too, but he he's not going to lose this opportunity. There's he's compelled. He's he's really both physically and emotionally compelled by that. Physically first, but then emotionally also. I was um, going to ask, like you touch on that a little bit, but I was like, because we don't see their like first meeting sort of thing. You do a little bit, right. not really. I was like, what is it about Ben that draws Ronnie? To him i'm assuming it's, looks oh yeah <laughs> just the sheer physicality the size of him the shape of him his eyes i mean there was i i lived in the dorm at chapel hill with the football players and they were you know they were six four they were hulks they were some of them were not at all attractive but there were a couple of them who just were they were physically arresting. You would, you couldn't take your eyes off them, or I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of my girlfriends at the time felt the same way. I would, they would come over to visit me in my dorm, and they go, "Wow, <laughs> the scenery around here is great." <laughs> <laughs> but the, the for for Ronnie, it's the feeling of this seething cauldron of a person that you know ben's not dumb ben's intense there's a lot of human in ben he's 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 older than his years already there's something about him that feels it, it makes ronnie feel like he's just got to know him and once he starts to know him he's just got to know him more and more so there's the, and I think the same is true for Ben, for Ben in terms of Ronnie in a different way. Ben, Ben feels drawn to Ronnie because of his, his brain, his intensity of his different kind of intensity. He's not physically as intense as, as, as Ben. And his his sort of savvy. I mean, I think Ronnie's a very savvy person, and, and Ben really likes that. Yeah. So they just click. There's a click between them. They do, and it feels like Ben almost is more comfortable in his sexuality, kind of once he makes up his mind, yeah. than than Ronnie. Yeah, almost. yeah, much more. I think. Well. Ben's more sex, more Ben's more comfortable with sex than than Ronnie is. Ben's had more sex than Ronnie has had, so he's 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 explored that part of himself more fully. So I think he's he's older than than Ronnie that way. Um, so, yeah, I mean Ben is one of the most comfortable men I've ever written about. You know my male characters are, are not always as comfortable as <laughs> as these guys are <laughs> especially fathers my fathers are always fraught <laughs> <laughs> ben's father really didn't have much uh much to do in this book <laughs> he's he's kind of numb i didn't want to make another villain father <laughs> um the mother is the one that I wanted to feature and the the father is sort of, I get the feeling he's been a problem and he's quieted down. He's gone into a, he's also numb by the, the ordeal that his wife is going through. But Ronnie doesn't become close to the father the way, the way he does to the mother. So he's, he's, you know, I just didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't click for me, really, <laughs> that character. <laughs> I didn't feel any need to go too far with him. So um, when you're writing a book, um, what is your writing process like? I'm always interested in hearing how, are, are you a plotter or are you more of a, um, a pantser, a seat of your pants whatever the characters say to you <laughs> probably more of a seat of my pants kind of a writer although that changes from book to book you know the especially in the rewriting i have to 
I have to look at what I've already written and make a plan. You know, at some point I have to have a plan. I guess that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yes. The process for books is different though, according to, I mean, this book, I can't remember exactly how fast I wrote it, but it was very fast. It was a matter of a few days of staying up all night that got, that's what I mean by I dived into it and just lived there. I didn't get much sleep for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the two weeks, I had a, a novel draft. And that was a really good thing because a lot of things happened, you know, sort of biochemically uh, in that process. Um, I couldn't question it. So the book took a direction and head there and got there and ended and, and, but then I was left with this mess because, you know, when you write that fast, you're not writing carefully. So that's, that's why it was, that's why it needed rereading and rereading and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Um, and that's, I've never written a book that fast before. I'm usually very considered and I'll do a, a paragraph or a couple of pages or a few pages a day, but you know, this one was coming out in huge chunks. I just wanted to know where they were going to go. And the only way to find out that out was to sit in front of my computer and keep typing. And, and, and I was, I was excited by what was happening with them. And, and I felt like I was racing to keep up with them and I didn't want to let them go. It felt like that as a reader as well. Like yeah. once, once I got into that book. Oh, that's good. I, <laughs> I was like, you know, I was like, okay, okay, okay. And then once we hit that flashback and sort of just kind of started really getting to the relationship, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you said you wrote this so fast. Where, where did the idea for this come from? Like what, what sort of um, prompted you to write this book? Well, I had lived in a boarding house for a summer in Chapel Hill, and I wanted to write about that. So I wrote about leaving the dorm, and I didn't even have a, no a notion that it was going to be a, a gay story at that point, but it almost immediately headed in that, that direction because there was Ben on the balcony of the dorm the day that he moved out not happy with him because not happy with Ronnie because Ronnie was leaving and hadn't said anything to him and suddenly I realized there was a depth already present between these two people that I really needed to trace down so the, the beginning moment was Ronnie leaving the dorm to go into the boarding house for the summer with his mother having left uh, the state to get married um, that sort of feeling that your childhood has abandoned you and you've been made into an adult overnight, whether you like it or not. Um, so that was the beginning moment. And after that, the moments just cascaded one after the other, you know? So I, like I said, I had to run to keep up with them because all of a sudden Ben was in the boarding house with him and they were taking their clothes off and they were together and, they were having a great time, but there was still this feeling of desperation and fear, especially in Ronnie. And then in both of them, when it turns out that, it's, that Ben's mother is sick, the, life keeps coming at them. And it kept coming at me in the course of the writing. And, and, and for a change, I didn't want to stop and figure it out because I was afraid, frankly, I was afraid I would, I would not believe I wouldn't believe in their love enough to finish the book because it was unlikely. So I didn't want to go away from it. I didn't want to leave it until I was so into it that I couldn't let it go, right? Would you ever want to revisit these characters again? I have, people ask that about the love stories that I've written. There are three of them. They want sequels to those books. The deeply unhappy books that I've written, they, nobody wants a sequel to those. <laughs> so the, the, the answer is yes, but I don't know if I would ever do it. Um, 
maybe I'll do it for at least one of them. Um, but honestly, I'm scared to look at the future between Ronnie and Ben because I, I want them to be together, but I don't know if, you know, how many times do you stay with your first love whom you collide with at college? Usually that's a relationship that doesn't last forever. Usually that's a volatile sort of coming together and then a volatile parting within a year or two. I mean, there are people who make it work, obviously, because a lot of people get married in, in their college years. But, you know, a lot of first marriages, most first marriages don't work out. You know, they don't last. So, so I'm sort of scared to look at their future. You know, and they've got the AIDS crisis is looming just ahead of them. And the likelihood is that one or both of them won't survive that. So there's a, there's a lot of possibility that they may not end happily. And I don't want to, I don't want, I don't think I could write that. I don't want, if I do look at them again, it will be to establish that they stay together till they're 80. <laughs> You don't want to make this one of your depressing books. No, no, I certainly <laughs> do not. <laughs> a happy story is depressing enough if you write about the world, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think there's a constant fear in this novel that they're going to explode, that they're going to, that they're not going to stay, that they're not even going to get through the book and be together. I was surprised. Yeah. I did kind of feel like I was like I I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing one thing I remember from the gay books that I did read in the eighties and the nineties, the early gay novels that started to come out after college and into the next couple of decades, was that there were very few of them that dealt with relationships at all, and if they did, the relationships were deeply unhappy, and they always came to an end. So I thought when I was writing this book and my novel Comfort and Joy, I wanted to write about relationships that did endure, at least to the end of the book. <laughs> Just so. the fact that they both live through the end of the book would have been yeah. surprised and stunning in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do think that is one way that there are so many, I'm just looking at my bookshelves right now and I I can point to like, 10 books on my bookshelf in front of me that have happy endings for their gay characters right 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 which is really nice yeah yeah i the older i get the more i want happy endings you know i, I and that's not terribly literary of me uh, but that's that's less important to me than it was when I was starting out as a writer. You know, I don't, I want, I want readers to be compelled by a book. And I want, especially if I'm writing for young gay kids, young lesbian kids, young transgender kids, I want them to, I want them to, to think there's a life worth living out there because that's vital. You know, we're beset by enough problems. We don't need, you know, it's worthwhile to examine the darkness, but at this point in my life, that's going to be somebody else's job yes. <laughs> in terms of a final darkness or a terminal darkness. <laughs> so when you were writing this book and was you were writing it so quickly, were you thinking of this? as a book as more of a young adult book or an adult book it's it's so interesting that and the slippery slope like some books are young adult and some books are are adult and how the publishing industry chooses to market. right right were you just you're just writing a book or did you have teens in mind as you wrote this book and i had teens in mind but i never really approached approached I never thought of it as being a category of book. I just thought, you know, I think I, my own late teenage years had been so intense that I wanted to write about that. And I didn't really worry about the marketing of it. 
I showed it to my original publisher, Algonquin, and, and they had published all my literary novels, but they were not excited by this book. But Arthur Levine, who had just started up his young adult publishing company, I mean, that's his thing, is he likes to write for young adults. He read the book and he told me, look, don't worry about whether it's going to be sold one way or the other, because we think we can sell it both ways. And we think it will fit perfectly well within the young adult category, but it'll also stand apart from that for a reader, an adult reader. You know, and, and frankly, adults read young adult novels. Oh, yes. Because I'm adults want to. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Because you want to revisit that youth in yourself, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's, it's the great lure of this kind of novel to me. So, I mean, I, I will, I've written about old age. I'm living old age. <laughs> but it's much more fun to, place myself into something else when I'm writing. You know, I, I, I'll i figure out how to blend the two later on, maybe. I do have an idea for a novel that will, that will carry me there, but we'll see if I live long enough to get it out. <laughs> well, when you write Ben and Ronnie, happily married at 80 <laughs> years old, there you go. Well, you know, I have three couples, as I said, that I that I, I I've been so I'm tempted to throw them all into the same book somehow, <laughs> 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 so that I deal with that old question once and for all. <laughs> like, yes, here, read this one. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the sequel to all my books. <laughs> I like it. It's kind of creating like a Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I do have to ask because okay. I enjoyed this book and I have puzzled over this cover. Okay. Do you did you have any say into the cover of this book? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't control it. I didn't try to control it. So I. <laughs> And several other librarians. We have uh, looked at the cover of this book and we're like, are these wings? Is this the dove? What is happening? That's a boy sitting inside the arms of another boy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a smaller boy being sort of physically surrounded by another boy. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the image that we chose when we chose that style of cover was actually a different. It was a, an image of two faces, but we couldn't get the rights to that picture. So the cover artist found this picture. And I, you know, I, I learned to like this. I love it now. I mean, I think it's, and I do think it has a wing suggestion to it. And that, I, so many conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this is the arm of the one boy. <laughs> yes, I see it now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> You've cleared up many conversations. <laughs> I think it's one of the prettiest books I've ever had. They do beautiful books at, at Levine Carrito. So it this is gonna be this is this is something only book collectors will understand. It has a very nice feel yeah. and weight to yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. It really does. And the dove on the cover I really love. And the dove the dove on the actual actual hardback, I think, is beautiful. So can't see it. Uh, a library copy in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll show. I'll show it to you. <laughs> right there. <laughs> oh, that is lovely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the things you miss when you can't take the mylar. That's cover. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, this has been absolutely 
lovely. Yes, it has. Thank you. <laughs> You're fun to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I was not sure when I started this book if I was going to like it. And mm -hmm. I ended up really, really enjoying it. Oh, I'm so grateful to hear that. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. And is there, I guess, as a librarian, I'm always interested in um, getting the right book into the hand of the right person. Mm -hmm. And who would you consider really, who should I be targeting this book to? Uh, older high school students. That's who I would, or mature junior high students. I mean, it really, my idea of kids is probably more conservative than they think of themselves. <laughs> you know. I do, I under, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, somebody who needs to, needs to know there's somebody out there for them. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who needs their identity affirmed, if this is close to their identity. Also, people who love, who like love stories. You know, I've had a lot of good response to this book from women readers, even though, you know, that doesn't seem intuitive, but it's happened before with my books and, and I'm not surprised by it, so. This has been a delight. All right, I think. We're going to wrap it up. Okay. Sounds lovely. Thank you all for having me. Well, if nobody has any questions, then we are going to go ahead and end our program for tonight. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Patty, for this lively conversation. I really enjoyed yeah. it. I had a blast. Thank you so much. Thank I you. I did too. <laughs> Thank you so much. You all have.